So welcome, my name is Steve Rosted, um, and I have a lot of slides to go through, so I'm going to jump right to that. So basically what the talk is about analyzing your system with tracing libraries, what does that mean? Well, I don't know how many people are familiar with the, uh, this tool, trace CMD, trace command, or so, kind of like so. Um, it's a tool that actually interacts with the tracing file system, also known as ftrace, but the tracing, uh, trace of S file system in the kernel, so you don't have to go in there. TraceFS was created basically for those that uh, with busy box in mind. So basically, if I'm coming from the embedded world way back in a long time ago, so I really have like a, a sweet heart for, or what's a sweet spot in my heart for embedded world. So I like busy box being controlling the whole tracing infrastructure. So I always try to like almost everything in um, the tracing infrastructure in the Linux kernel can be done basically from a simple busy box command line. You know. Echo, cat, stuff like that. So, but not everyone likes to use shell scripts or shell commands to communicate. So TraceMD was made to make it easier. I use it all the time. I use TraceMD to interact with the tracing system because it's so much easier to use. Um, you can also trace long data. So something you can't really do in uh, BusyBox where, you, well, you technically can, but uh, it records the raw data from the ring buffer very fast and equivalent. It uses a splice. Uh, splice system call, uh, wave splice system call, if you don't, are unfamiliar with it, it's a way of giving um, a file descriptor through a pipe to another file descriptor where you can actually pass data without, with zero copy from one file to another file. So it takes the data right from the ring buffer and uh, takes it right out, the page right out of the ring buffer and puts it right into the file without any copying. It doesn't go through user space or anything else. So it's extremely efficient, extremely fast. That's the way uh, uh, tracing was set up. Uh, Trace, TraceMD is constantly expanding to handle, like when I, I maintain both the trace infrastructure in the kernel as well as TraceMD. So when I try to add, when I add stuff to the kernel, I also try to add stuff to TraceMD. So TraceMD always tries to keep up with the latest and greatest uh, technologies. It does fall behind. But a simple example of TraceMD uh, is, you know, you do the record. Right here I'm doing sked switch. I put a little filter in there because I only want uh, anything's next prior under 100, 120. By the way, inside the kernel, priorities are inverse, which means that the lower the priority, the higher the priority is. So zero is the highest priority of any task within the kernel, with so because zero, zero is equivalent to priority of a real-time priority of 100, actually higher than that. Um, but here I'm looking at you know just doing wake up latency. I want to say okay, uh, just trace any task that is below 120. 120 is the default. Um, Sket other tasks. So this is basically tracing all real-time tasks. And then the output, it will show you how it will take the data, it compresses it, and puts it in the file, it tells you where it is in the offset in the file. And then you do TraceMD report, and it actually shows you the data. Very simple stuff. Um, now, what's the talk? Well, the thing is, I also like other people using the utilities here. So I'll, everything in TraceMD, my goal is to make TraceMD a shell around the libraries. So I'm trying to move all the functionality from TraceMD out in the open. So first of all, there was this libtrace event, which perf uses, and I think the other tools use it. Libtrace event um, is a good thing for parsing raw events, and libtracefs. Libtracefs is the way that you can have your applications interact with the tracing subsystem without having to know about sys kernel tracing. In fact, it will, you have to be root to use it, but it will mount the tracing infrastructure if it's not already mounted. If it's already mounted, it will find it and use it. You don't have to look at it. So it abstracts out a lot of the use cases for uh, working with the uh, tracing system. Libtrace event is needed because it parses the, it's how you parse the raw data. You get the raw data in binary format. You have to know how you want to, uh, you're not going to just put out a bunch of hex decimals, you're not going to be able to uh, understand any of that. But you do want to read the stuff. So it could parse the, uh, uh, the format files and creates, uh, the, shows you the uh, events or the fields within the event of the format files. So if you do trace command list dash E, which is uh, I want to see events. So I want to see the sketch switch event dash capital F here means show me the format file. And here's the format file for the sketch switch event. Uh, this tells you, it shows you like the offset into the raw data. And by the way, everything that TraceMD do is just interact with the TraceFS system that you can actually get the same information from BusyBox. So if you were to, uh, you get the same output if you were to do cat slash sys slash kernel slash, or slash sys slash kernel slash tracing slash um, events slash sked slash sked switch slash format. But that's a lot to type. So jumping right into this. Simple TraceFS program. 
as I said, and we have C in this talk. So uh, here I'm going to talk about some of the functionalities, so you don't have to look at this in, uh, in detail. By the way, all my code I'm showing is uploaded on my website, so you can download any of this if you want to see it. Um, so from here, uh, I'm like, well, I'll let him take a picture if he wants to, but I'll, have, I'll come back to it. Anyway, the very first thing I do is uh, trace the best local events. This will actually go through and read all the information uh, about the events in there. So basically it scans all the events in the trace of S directory and records the format files and puts, does it all for you. So you just run this once. Sometimes it takes a couple seconds to run uh, to execute this one code because it's loading all the events up. You could limit it. Uh, there's also another function that you could just say, give me a couple systems I care about so you don't have to do all the events in the system because there's thousands of events. Uh, so the first parameter, or, or basically it takes, uh, right now it takes one parameter and if it's null, it will, it will mount the TraceFS file system. If it's not mounted, it'll find it and it'll load everything up for you. Uh, the reason why I could take a path is sometimes what I'll do is I will be on another machine that I want to run some code on and I want to load the events from that other machine. So I would copy the, the event directories, in, you know, tar it up, put it into on my local machine, and then I would put this path to that a directory and it could actually will parse that instead. So it's a very, it's a use case I seldom use and probably very few people ever use. Null will be mostly your use case that you'll use, but just in case that feature is there. So it reads all the trace event format files and creates a structure, TEP handle. TEP, the reason why it's called TEP, that's trace event um, parser. And <clears throat> This is how, this, is the, this handle will store all the information you need to be able to read the binary um, uh, data and create it, get, make it into something that's human readable. So, the next thing I do is TraceFS event enable. It takes three parameters. The first parameter, which if it's null, it's syskernel tracing. But you can also pass in an instance, which would be like syskernel tracing instances foo. The instances directory there, if you do make dir, sys kernel tracing instances foo, it will create a whole new ring buffer and have its own set of events and all sets of controls. Um, the instance is actually a structure that you could actually create an instance, but that's out of the scope right now, but it's in the man pages. The uh, second parameter is the system, um, which could be SCED. So inside the uh, ring, uh, inside the trace of us events directory, you'll see a bunch of directories, those are systems. So all the scheduling events is within one directory and it's called the sched directory. Um, <clears throat> you could pass in null if you don't know what it is because what it will do then is it'll take, look at the third parameter and we'll look at all the events and it'll find, oh, this is in sched. So if you don't, you don't have to remember, memorize sched. In fact, actually, if you looked at the original program, I put, passed in null to it. And the third parameter is obviously the event name. Now, the next thing I do is I iterate, I want to iterate all the events. So I enable the events, now I'm going to iterate through them. So I pass in this function called traceFS iterate raw events, and it will actually, um, well, if you pass it, the first parameter is the tep instant, the handle that was returned from traceFS uh, local events. The next parameter is, um, again, the instance handler, if you want to iterate through an instance, null for the tap, top level. Uh, this could be null, uh, this is a CPU mask, so if you want to just trace a single CPU or CPU set, you would put the CPUs, the CPU size is the size of the CPUs masks. Um, then you pass on a callback handler. Then this callback will be called on every single event that you hit. And then if you want to pass data to that callback handler, you pass it here. So the callback receives this. It gets a event type, which is, a, is from libtracefs, it's, a, it's like a, a, a tep event handle. It gives you, um, with, if you want to get the actual tep handle from, you can actually get through it, it's, the structure is right there to get to the handle. The next parameter is the record, which is the raw data that it read, parsed. But it has, it's not just a raw data, but it's a structure that points to the raw data and has some other information, has a timestamp and everything else from that. it. Um, a CPU, now this is a misnomer. I tell people don't use this CPU, it's a unique identifier, but you can read multiple instances. There's another call, there's another function where it's a iterate over several different files. You could iterate over instances and stuff like that and correlate them. And the order of the uh, instances are not, um, or the C will determine the CPU number. That is, 
the first instance will be zero to, like say if you have like four CPUs. So you have zero to three for your first CPU. Well, the next instance, the first CPU, like I said, is usually zero. But when you go look at the next instance, or when I do it, that would be CPU four. It would be four through seven. So if you really want to get to the actual CPU, the record itself has the CPU that it was on. So if you need the actual CPU, don't use the CPU that's passed into the callback, use the record CPU. And then the data is the data that you pass to trace uh, events, trace iterate raw events. Now, the next thing I had was struct seek. Uh, okay, so this is, tra um, so trace seek is co copied actually from the kernel, the Linux kernel has this as well. It's basically a way to pass strings around. So it could build up strings and pass, so you could pass it to a function and it could write strings into this and then pass it to another function and write more and pass it to another one and write more and then at the end you could just say, hey, here's my full string. So it's a, it's a good, easy way to do, um, uh, create a large output of strings by using, uh, just passing around a descriptor to various functions to add stuff. I say it's pretty much identical to this. Um, I usually, in my callback, I made it static and then I just initialize it. Uh, trace seek init will initialize it the first time so, because it needs to allocate some data and stuff like that, so you need to initialize it. I do that once. Um, I use trace seek terminate, which will put the zero at the end, so then you could actually print the, like, then print the buffer. You do trace seek do printf, which is just basically this printf, printf of the sequence buffer that was built up, so then it's just to printf. And if I want to use it again, instead, I already initialized it, but let's say I want to reset and start from scratch again, I just do trace seek reset, which will start, the, will erase the old buffer, will not erase it, but zero it out and I guess start from scratch. Then I do have this. This is actually a neat little um, powerful function, uh, tep print event. So first parameter is the tep event. The second parameter is the sequence that it's going to write into. Like I said, this is how you could pass things around. Uh, this, you just pass it, it's going to write it into the sequence, the data. The raw data, the record to the raw data. A format, which is like a printf format, but the args are very special. They're not normal args. For reason why, one of the args could be tep print com, where you would put a percent s, and it will actually write the name of, like, a, so what the com is basically the process name. So if you have, like, Chrome running, and it trace the event, this would be Chrome. So if you want to print the, uh, the process name, you put tep print com, and it would write that in there. If you want the process ID, tep print PID. If you want to know what CPU, which is basically the record CPU, it would do tep print CPU. You don't have to actually say record CPU. The time, I'll get more detail in doing the timestamp. And the name of the event. And finally, the info. This is the TP print K format of the um, event, which, uh, this is the print time. So in my print time, I had percent six dot thousand D. This is a special, it's not really precision of what you would think it is, because this is, a, like I said, a special command. So what this does, it takes a timestamp, which is usually nanoseconds. So you have a long timestamp. And it will, then it will divide it by a thousand, that's the second one, and then move the decimal point by six. So uh, like I said, defaults times um, nanoseconds. And the above annotation will give me if it's nanoseconds, it'll actually give me seconds with a period and then down to microsecond precision. So let's say this is the timestamp from here. This is the raw timestamp number in nanoseconds. First thing it does, divides and rounds. So you notice that this, if you notice it ends with a six, so it does a round up because it was five, six. At, you know, at the very end, five, um, let's see if you can see this, yeah. If you can see five, six, two, nine, the five, it rounded up to make that Seven six, not seven five. The uh, now it will move the decimal point six spaces. So whoops, I wanted to go back. So the uh, that's the, the seconds. This was running for this uptime was you know two thousand four hundred twenty five seconds when I ran this trace. Because actually I took this copy from the actual trace. So going back, this is the program again that I showed you before, and like you said, you notice the nulls in the uh, beginning of the events. Now. Here's how I enabled the event. Um, I slept for a second, I disabled the event, and then I iterated over all the events, and this was my output. Almost exactly what you get from TraceCMD. Um, that one little program is this. So now, let's say I wanted to enable all events. 
So on the event side, I just, instead of putting sketch switch, I just pass null. So I went null, null. So null basically means a wild card. So I want all events. So when I run tracing, I get this, all the events. So this is actually actual cut and paste from the actual application that you can download and try it yourself. Trace CMD, um, so like I said, my idea, I think I want to do is to make trace CMD into a wrapper. So I also have a lib trace CMD that I'm allowing others to use. Currently, lib trace CMD only reads trace.dat files. I, I eventually want to make it create trace.dat files, but I'm trying to come up with a good API to do so. So it's mostly, it's not like I'm preventing people from doing it, it's just that to have a good API takes some effort to work, because right now the API is a little cryptic and I don't want to pass that out. So, like I said, you can use TraceMD to create the trace.dat file for you. But then, say you want to analyze it with some tooling. So, this is basically the same thing I did earlier, just TraceMD record, uh, sked switch, sked waking, sleep one. And I can have this program, this program is almost identical to the previous program, except it reads a TraceMD file. Um, here's the diff between the two files. So the callbacks are almost identical, except you'll notice that um, it has a tracemd git tep uh, handle and stuff. I'm not going to really focus too much on lib tracemd. By the way, all this have man pages. So everything I have here, I have, and my man pages, a lot of the man pages have examples. Not all of them have good examples. Uh, there was a lot of rush to get the man pages out, so, but I'm trying to fix that. So there's some very good examples in there around. So that program, this is, I wrote the output of lib tracemd program off of that trace.dat file I created and almost got the exact same output. Now, one thing you might notice is that the output of the tracefs program is this, and the output of the libtracemd program is that below. So why the difference? Okay, rhetorical question, you don't have to answer it. I'll answer it. So if I were to, by the way, if I were to do tra trace command list dash e sketch switch dash capital F, that only gives you the formats, but if I want the print, the, uh, the TP print K, I have to do dash dash full. That mess right there below is actually what is done inside the kernel as well as what uh, libtracemd could do, and this is what the tep parser uses. So the tep parser reads all this. This is why you want that tep libtrace event, because libtrace event knows how to read that garbly gook at the bottom there. But if you look at the format, that's very similar to the uh, one on top, but not similar to the one on bottom. The reason why is, here's the output format, and the reason why is libtracemd also has some plugins that are shipped with it that make things a little nicer. And this is, uh, you could override the default print of any event and put your own way of parsing the print. So this is the uh, lib, um, you notice it has the, uh, whoops, you notice it has uh, the same styles and this is how it formats it. Using the trace seek, it just kind of lowly builds it up. And you can write your own, by the way. So I'm going to uh, go, did you want a back picture of that one? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to jump into a new work in project, uh, uh, work in process um, library. It's actually over a year old, and I'm still kind of using it for here. It's called libtracyval. One thing I noticed when I wrote all these an analysis tools, I kept having this. I kept having doing the same thing over and over again. Of course, you know Larry Wall once said the best programmers are the lazy programmers because we don't like to do things more than once. If like, we can find an easier way to do it, we'll do it, we'll do it like write a tool or write a script or something to do it for us. So I found out that when I analyze, do the trace iterate walk, I'm constantly looking at events and how it relates to other events, like sked wake, sked switch. You know, when it process was woken up, when it was scheduled on the CPU. Very simple uh, example, which I'll use. Um, by the way, this does not depend on any other libraries. And I think I even have the license is different. It might even be Apache license. I don't, I don't remember. So it's a completely separate, license, uh, separate thing. Still, still work. It's still kind of cryptic. Um, and I have it on GitHub. So one library that's not on kernel.org. The other three, all the libraries, the libtrace fs, that's on kernel.org. Libtrace eval is on GitHub. So like I said, it was easy, easier to way to make latency um, better. And it was kind of based on how the histogram logic inside the Linux kernel. So the concept is this. Um, 
it has, it, the libtracyval has a descriptor that's based off of some keys and some values. So keys are what makes the item unique in there. So like a process ID, that's gonna be unique and it can be tracked. And then you attach values to this. So values are stored per key. Uh, a new value, if a new value, or sorry, say if a key already exists and you add a new value, it's going to overwrite the old value with the new value. So basically you can always constantly retrieve key information from the last time this process was done. There's a special delta value that is a number that's going, it's going to create, uh, basically keep track of, you know, max, min, um, standard deviation, total, the count, number of times it was added. So this is basically a running number that's automatically kept with the key. You could create a delta helper on top, top of this uh, descriptor so that you could actually trace via other um, keys. So you could create your own keys that you want to trace. And I, I needed this for my wake-up latency tracer. So this is a, gives you a way of adding a start time and an end time and then keep track of the counters and progress and everything else. So to create the key, uh, this is where like, you know, creating a new library, you gotta create a new API and that sucks. APIs are hard. And this actually, I rewrote APIs over and over again. If you look at my Git history, I'm constantly finding ways. This is why I haven't released it yet because I wanna make it, I want it to be a nice API before it's fully released so it's still in the development process. So let me say I just want to schedule keys and I'm gonna keep track of the process ID and the, the process name, the com. Okay, so there's a macro to help you create this because these are special structures, they're tracy val type. So I have a number for the PID and a string for the com. Now I'm going to use the delta element as my value. So for my values, I'm going to trace it as a delta element. And for even to help more helping things, because it was kind of hard to keep track of indexes because it's an array and you have to make sure everything's lined up nicely. I started adding these things. So you could create, it doesn't have to be size t here, but I just use size t, I don't know why. But uh, first I created a bunch of helper, like uh, you know, uh, static indexes inf information so I know how I can use this later in my program for indexing into array. Of course I set, um, I set it up and then when I go here, I, when I initialize one of the arrays, um, remember the sked keys, sked files I had? I have a trace of array size that gives you a nice macro to you know, figure out the array size. It's basically the same macro as the array size in the kernel, but I wanted to give it a unique name. And um, <clears throat> then when you could set it, you notice that it uses in the red over here, it uses the uh, indexes up that were here. This is so when I know set number, I want to uh, add the PID to, into the key, I have to have a way to index it. So that's how come I do it this way. If you can think of a better way, then great. And eventually, okay, so for the delta side of things, this is for on the delta recording, I did the same thing for the delta side. And let's see, so I wanna start tracing. So the way I start is trace eval delta start, and I start a timer, and then I will end a timer, stop you here, just passing the PID into the information, so it'll record it there. And then what I do is I actually asked for um, the, val, the val here from the stop, the val here um, is the value that was the delta between the start and stop. And then I add that value into my other table that's going to say, hey, my PID and com is the mat. So I have a process ID and a com name that's going to be the uh, keys and I'm going to put the delta value in there. So, for my lake up latency program that I'm going to write, that I'm going to use libtracyval. So the first thing I do is I initialize the data. So I have my own little um, data structure that I'm going to initialize. So it's basic, this is just initialize it, no big deal. And now I'm going to do load, let me give me all the events. I didn't have to do all the events, I could have just done the sked events, but you know, I just, I said, do all events, this is the easiest code, this is just, a way of doing easy code. If you want to know more, uh, make this more optimized, whatever, optimize it better, uh, there's man pages. And you notice there's something different here. There's something I didn't show in the first round. Trace of S follow event. So follow event means that I don't have to parse which event is being called. Remember in the iterate, it iterates through all events. So yeah, I'm only interested in a single event. So I have two callbacks, two following. One of them is going to follow the sked switch event when context switches happen. And the other one is the sked wake event. So when something wakes up, 
it gets the callback happens for that event. So I also, from here, I'm going to filter it. I'm only interested in real-time tasks. So I want the prio from under 100. What priority under 100, remember, lower is higher. So inside the kernel, you know, 0 to 99 is real-time task. I know 120 we've mentioned before, but usually 0 to 99. So what I do is I, this is, a, uh, again, lib trace event thing. Anything with tap is a lib trace event macro thing. So I said, here, find my, find my the event handle. And I just searched for sked waking. I could have put in, that second one is the, is the uh, I could have put in sked, but I left it null. I'm like, wildcard, you could figure out what it is. There's only one sked waking event in the system. I don't need to tell you where it is. It gives me the mat handle, and then I have this little filter string append, which basically, this has man pages all about it. You don't have to do with it. Um, whoops, let me go back. Basically, it will, this filter compares, like compare the prio field, make sure it's less than, ooh, this is, wait, I'm curious. You can see it now, it's, it's less than 100. I noticed that uh, it went off the screen. <laughs> My bold, well, I made it bold. So yeah, it said less than 100 there. Um, yeah. Then I enabled both events. This time, this is something a little bit different. Last time I enabled, slept, and closed. I enabled the events, and then I said, I did this run program. Run program is simply a um, way of, I just fork and exec whatever you pass to it. And then I do the iterate raw events until the program ends. Now, by the way, trace of its iterate raw events, when it, if, it, if it goes faster than the input, it will return. That's why I have to have it in a while loop. I actually do have one that will block. I do, I'm working on adding an interface that will block instead. If there's, if there's no events, it will just block and wait, and you can signal it to stop. And then I disable the events, and eventually just, OK, um, well, I clear the filter, because I don't want the filter there anymore. I want to delete it. Don't want to leave it around for anyone. And then I'm going to show my output. So the uh, wake up latency program, I have to start off with, here's the beginning of it. This is the. Uh, uh, my little data structure that I passed. I have, I'm going to map the events by process ID. So I, want, I care about when a process ID wakes up, or when, when the task wakes up, I'm going to look at the process ID. And when a task, task schedules on the CPU, I'll use the process ID to, that's, I want those two mapped. But I don't want to worry about it. I want, I'll let the libtraceval do the mapping. Where, how am I going to store this information? I want to store the process ID, the com, and the prio, because this is up I want to show at, at the output, at the end. And I want to use the delta as my output format. So I first, here's the initialization, remember um, a part of it. I remember I showed you before how I said you could create all the helper, helper things. So I just did all this helper stuff. And this just initializes the uh, uh, trace, del the, um, what's it called, over here. Trace of LNet gives you a descriptor. The trace, uh, trace of L delta create, that gives me the delta element that allows me to start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. And then, of course, just initialize these indexes. So when a scheduling, when the wake up event happens, this gets called. So first thing I do is, OK, um, I want to initialize the PID field. You notice that it's static. It's a static variable because this is a tap format file, I need to uh, initialize it so because this will help me parse that event. So I want to be able to parse this event, so I need to initialize the tap field. So I just make it stack, static. And if it's null, the first time it's null, I'm like, OK, initialize it. Then every call, I don't need to initialize it again. Then I do is, OK, tap read number field to get the value. By the way, the lib trace event API sucks. I'll tell you that. Reason why is because I wrote the lib trace event for, um, uh, for trace command. And before it was ready to be given away, Frederick Weisbecker took that code and put it into perf. So it could use it too. When, so now I was like, oh great, perf is using it. Then PowerTop, we had a whole issue with PowerTop. PowerTop needed it, so I copied it to PowerTop. And then it, uh, who, the RAS daemon used, needed a way to parse events, so they copied it. So I had like four different copies of loop trace event around. And I had to merge them all together. With, and the API was not really developed yet, so, but because there's four different projects using it, it was kind of set in stone already. So I got stuck with this API because of that. So lib trace event, I wish I could rewrite the API, but eh. So tep read number field, it's a crappy API a little bit, but gives you the value of the field that I'm looking for, which is process ID. Now this is the trace eval stuff. I'm like, okay, 
let me initialize the process ID to the, uh, the key, and then I'm going to call trace eval delta start to start the timer. This is the context switch. This happens, this is the code that gets called when the sketch switch event ha wait, happens. So now the uh, tasks are switching. And the first thing I do is like, okay, again, initialize the fields, I the event fields I want to care about. So I care about the prio, the com, and the, um, uh, the PID. So the sketch switch event has a previous event and a next event. The previous event is, a, is the task that's being scheduled off the CPU. The next event is the task that's being scheduled on the CPU. I care about the task that's being scheduled on because it just woke up. So I'm looking for that mapping. Um, so I need, I want the priority of it, the process ID, and the prior. I know that these, that's information from the event that I can get from it. Now I actually read that information from the raw data. Record has the raw data in there. So I said, okay, give me the, uh, the PID, set it, give me the com. The com, I have to make a better, like I said, this, this is, I'm going to make a helper function for that. It's nasty. Man pages still show it. Um, and then I get the uh, priority of the task. I now, I'm going, okay, okay, I got the process ID. Uh, so I call trace eval delta stop. If it finds it, if there's a trace eval delta start, it will uh, return zero. Or sorry, return one. If, it if, there's, if there was a matching PI okay, PID, if there was a trace eval delta start for this PID, it would return one and set the value to it. If it doesn't find it, it returns zero. So, and if there's an error, for whatever reason, there's a, something's wrong, it'll be negative one. So I only care if there's a one which means that something woke up. Otherwise, this scheduling event, I don't care about. Throw it out, it doesn't get used, boom. So if it's not equal to one, I return. I ignore the rest. If it equals to one, if bound to start, stop, and there's a delta. So now, that's what I said, now I could record it. So I set up the keys with the matching keys, I put the prio, com, boom, and I call trace about insert, which kind of inserts it into the table. Well, after that's all done, I want to display my results. So I have show latency. So the first thing it does is <clears throat> will create an iterator on how I iterate this. So you say iterate this val because I'm going to iterate through all my results. You can sort it. There's several sorting algorithms. And uh, I will say, OK, give it the name of the prior. I'm going to sort it by priority. Um, the second, so. This is, uh, for, so priority, uh, sorry, iterator, the field that you want to sort it by. Um, zero is precedent. So if you want to add a second prior, like a second sorting precedence thing, I could call this again with a one. And by the way, if, if you called it with a one first, it would give you an error saying there was no zero. So you have to do zero, one, two, three. And then false means uh, this is whether you want ascending or descending. I said I want it descending, so I'm going to put false in there. And then I just do trace iterator next, which now will loop through, and it will pass me all the keys, the key information. So if anyone here is a Perl fan, if you've ever done the loop you know, for each over an array or whatever, and you get your keys, very similar to that. OK. So see, actually, in my slides, I actually described some of this stuff. <laughs> I forgot about that. So now I want to print the information. So I want to print the keys. I want to print everything that I recorded. So I said, OK, here, print. I give me the keys, the string. Um, the, so I get the uh, com, the process ID, and the prio. And I'll print that out. Then I want the delta stuff. So there's, there's a trace eval stat that could process deltas very nicely for you. So it uh, gives you the statistics, max, min, total, blah. And then I'm going to print it here using, hey, give me the stat total, give me the stat count. And there's other things. I could have done standard deviation, whatever, max, min. And when I ran this, my, okay, so I ran this on my program, um, Migrate, which is, um, I used this for when I was creating the real-time um, scheduler uh, push-pull logic inside the Linux kernel, because uh, we found out that the scheduling of real-time tasks uh, Migration was very poor, so it needed to have like a just in, like when a new process was um, being scheduled on the a new process was being scheduled. 
you, uh, the higher priority, you want to make sure if there's a CPU available for it, you want to migrate to it and bounce. So I wrote this program that stresses that. And, uh, but the thing is, it's also a great program for doing tests on tracing, too, because it gives you a lot of data to well. So when I ran this program, this was the output that I got from it. The K worker happens to be, um, by the way, the priority, it said it's priority of uh, 100. I don't know, so K worker is just is like between, it's actually a non-real-time test. I think that's a, the sked other. I might be like super nice or something. And then I have the um, 97, 96, 95. So this is actually the lowest priority uh, going to the highest priority, believe it or not. Even though the highest number, the numbers are going from um, uh, what's called high to low, it's actually, yeah, so it's going from the first, the 97 is a lower priority than the 96, you know, 95. So, and it gives me the migrate program, it gives me the, um, the name of the, ta uh, what's called the, the migrate task, it gives me the process ID for the task, it gives me the priority of the task, and then it tells me the max, and also tell, it gives you the timestamp. Remember, when you, you passed in the timestamp when you do the uh, start and stop, it will actually record the timestamp of where the max and min was. Not so great for when you're doing a live trace, but when you're analyzing a trace.dat file, this is why I usually do this on a trace.dat file. So when it tells me, oh, the timestamp's here, I can actually open up uh, the trace.dat in my kernel shark or something, find that timestamp, and then that will tell me, okay, why was this, the latency here was so bad, and I could find the information from this. It'll show me where the max was. So um, everything is max min is in nanoseconds, by the way. So that's why these numbers are quite big. I didn't do the conversion. So that, you know, the max of that one right there was what? Uh, 1.7 milliseconds, it looks like. But that was at the lowest priority that was being pushed, which was actually good. By the way, inside the libtrace eval program, the, um, there's a task eval program that actually is written for you. You look at it, it's there, you download it. I use this all the time because it tells, it gives me all this information. It'll tell me like, okay, how long the CPU was idle? How long the tasks run for it? And um, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, let's see, idle time, um, run time for tasks. And then it breaks it down per every single task in the system. It'll tell you, okay, this task, um, let's see, it says, it gives you how long it ran. You know, max, min, average, standard deviation, wake up time, how long, this is the wake up latency that I kind of just showed, here's the wake up, average wake up latency. Block time, how long things were, something was, it was in the task uninterruptible state. Um, sleep time was when it was in the task interruptible state. Preempted means that how long was it, it got, you know, it was running on the, on the CPU, then something came in of a higher priority or whatever and cooked, kicked it off, and then it had to come back on it. It gives you that information as well. So this is a lot of information that you got and the program's actually not that big. Anyway, click on the pony. Uh, if you go to w, uh, www.tracecommand.org, uh, if you click on the pony, it brings you to all the man pages. <laughs> Obvious, right? <laughs> um, and the code is here. Questions? Yes. <laughs> oh, yep, yep, so I'll repeat your, I'll repeat. Oh, yeah, sure. oh. Do any of the libraries that you showed have any integration with uh, visualization tools like, I don't know, Profeto? Well, Kernel Shark. Trace Viewer. Yeah, Kernel Shark. Yeah, Kernel Shark uses this. But can like a third party generate the data? Yeah, the actually we've, a we've actually had like VMware and stuff like that and actually we'll have, so there's work to get perf data, stuff like that. So the parse, as long as you have something to parse it, they'll read it. And that's actually the goal was actually to get everyone else. I created these libraries to share. Now. Other libraries are LGPL. People have issues with LGPL. I wish I could actually go back. I don't care if you use it in a binary or even link it in a, um, you know, statically link it to a proprietary um, program. I just, if you modify the code, I want the code back. That's all I care about. So I might want to try to see if I can find a way to talk to a lawyer to kind of maybe modify the license just to say, you know, it's LGPL as in if you touch the code, but you could link it or whatever statically or do whatever you want with it. I don't care. Any other questions? Oops, one over there. By the way, it's 140 some slides. So, so I heard that you could use uh, synthetic infant and in F-trace with some histogram trigger that could also calculate the like, min, max, and average. Like, how, yes. What's the relationship with uh, trace FL, I guess? So that's done in the kernel. 
So the histogram code, in fact, actually, LibTraceFS has, uh, okay, so we're out of time, but we have lunch, so I don't care. We get tired, so uh, well, a couple minutes. Ago. But anyway, the, um, so the, um, inside the kernel, we do all that stuff. I wanted to do it on static data, trace.dat data afterwards. That's what these things were created. So actually, it follows a lot. There's a libSQL. Actually, there's a, uh, a TraceFS supplies a uh, TraceFS SQL program that you actually could make an SQL string that will create synthetic events for you. And you could, and actually trace command now has a command, trace command SQL, that you could pass in a SQL thing to create the events as well. So that's on the man pages as well. There's examples for the code for that. But I just wanna let you know if you, like you, I'm not, I don't care for SQL, but it's great because the way SQL, like think about events, you know, each event is a table. You know, each instance is a row. The fields are columns. So SQL works really, really well to say, I want this event attached to this event. You know, it's just, it's the SQL join command. Any other, well, one last question and then probably. Thank you. If not, thank you very much.